Okay, awesome. So everyone's on. Um, I really appreciate you guys for asking this of me. Um, I had a lot of fun creating this presentation and it was a really great refresher for myself, just going over these basics and compiling this together. Um, as I was doing and putting together this presentation in this little workshop, I realized that there's so much information as a result, as it relates to investing and that it would be easier from a brain capacity standpoint and from a time standpoint to just focus on one part of it, which for today will be long-term <laughs> investing. And then in the future, I may do other ones on various other aspects of investing. So today is just long-term, which I feel is the most popular type of investing. So um, this is the flow of the workshop today. So I'm gonna talk about what is long-term investing? What types of long-term investments can you make? Examples of investing platforms, talking about how to research investments, setting goals, types of investment accounts, taxes, and then there'll be some time at the end, of course, to ask any final questions if you have them. Um, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, just raise your hand. And then once I'm done with what I'm saying, then I can um, have you ask your question and then we can address it. Um, I encourage you to raise your hand throughout if you have a question come up, because we're gonna be talking about a, a lot of different subjects. So um, I want to, I, I would like to keep the questions as relevant to what we're talking about as possible. So if you're like, oh, I have a question, but maybe I'll wait, don't wait, just raise your hand. <laughs> and I can call on you and we can make sure that we're all on the same page before we move on to the next subject. So before we start, does anyone have any questions? Where is the raise hand? I, 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 is it reactions? Yeah, there it is, I got it. Okay, yeah. cool. Any other questions? Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to know if I could introduce Matt real quick since we're all on this together and he's right here. Oh, yes, of course. Tell me that sexy bastard. I'll get more light, but other than that, this is the more. Oh, maybe. Okay, come here. What? Come here. What you? you. Oh, hey, everybody. Wait, is Give us a 360. Out? I want to see the backside. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. <laughs> He's a keeper. He's a keeper. He's a keeper. How's that? That's perfect. That's, That's exactly great. what I would do. Um, just oh to preface, guys, this will be going on the internet. So. Oh. Oh. Great. Oh great. Yes, I am okay. recording. I'm going to get so. ready. Okay. Nice to meet you, Nate. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs> yeah. So he'll be uh, listening in, but we're we're in the process of packing. All right, this is on the internet. All right, we're done. We're done. Bye. <laughs> um, also, if you don't have something to write with and write on, I recommend you grab that now. I really strongly recommend that you guys take notes throughout this. It's really going to help you um, not only retain the information, but like take note of things that are really relevant to you. I'm going to be talking about a lot of different types of long-term investing, the aspects of it. And you might not want to necessarily, you might not need to take notes on everything, but you especially do on the things that are most interesting or pertinent to you. Okay. Yeah, like All right. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to play a little game. It's really short. We're going to do investment bingo. And I want you to write these nine little characteristics on your paper. Just draw like two lines and then two lines, make the boxes. It's really simple, three by three. And you're going to fill in the boxes with the question, with the little items here.
can't believe she's forcing me to be analog. I had my digital all set up. What? No complaining. Analog, paper, pen, not oh. a digital device. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I'm going caveman style. Okay. Um, Starting from the original. I was set up for original, but I'll play. Okay, I'm gonna put X in the top left corner. Who's next? We haven't started yet. Just write down, write it the box. It's a joke, tic-tac-toe. <laughs> We're supposed to write down what's in the boxes, right? Yes, write these nine characteristics on paper, write them in the boxes. That's all you're doing. And then I'll let you know what the next step is. What's the middle one say? Owns blank in an EFT on mutual fund. Stop. Owns share. In sure. an EFT or a mutual fund. Yeah, your timer is your timer is not blocking the the words. Oh, sorry. Let's see if I can move that. Is it all a ducky? Uh, I can't move it, but I'll just remove it now. Okay. And do you want us to circle them? Um, once you're done, yes. Circle the ones that apply to you. Okay, I have questions about some of these things, which I probably, well, I have questions about some of these things. Um, okay, let me see who, is anyone else still writing these out? I'm writing the last one right now. All right, done. Okay, what about you, Jason? Are you still writing? Are you still muting me? Okay, I'm assuming that you're done writing. Lada, are you done writing? Uh, she seems totally unaware. Lada, you're muted. Okay. Are you oh, done I'm writing? So sorry. Yes, I am. Okay, awesome. Okay, what was your question, Ebony? Um. Is a um, so I'm signed up with Robinhood. Would that mean that I have a brokerage account or no? Yes. Okay. That's my wait. Mm, not necessarily, but circle it anyway. Okay. And I'll I'll you'll understand why that's a maybe later. <laughs> okay, that's that's what I thought. That's why I asked. Um, Okay, if you've already written them out, then if you haven't yet, please circle which of these items relate to you. And we'll start first with has a 401k. So who has a 401k? Show physical hands. Okay, who has an IRA? Mine's either an IRA or a Roth IRA. Okay. Who has a financial advisor? Dope, Letta, cool. That, that's like fidelity, right? 
I mean, Fidelity is a company that offers a variety of services. So just because you're with, you have an account with Fidelity doesn't mean that you have a financial advisor. Okay. And that's okay if you're not sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Who has a brokerage account? Maybe. Okay. Letta, you should raise your hand. Oh. Probably okay. do. Okay. Okay. Who has bought or sold an investment, whether it's like a stock, bond, EFT, mutual fund, anything like that? Okay, cool. Who has a Roth IRA? I think I do. Who is a beginner? Always. Yeah, I still feel like a beginner in very much, very many ways, even though I, I, I know more than you guys at the moment. Okay, cool. I thought this would just be really fun to see sort of where we all stand on these things. And we're going to talk about all of these things for the most part in this, um, in this presentation. So um, I want you to write in your journal, like why you want to learn about investing. It doesn't have to be super long, just like write a sentence or two about why you want to learn about it. Like it's really important to sort of remember like what sort of sparked this inspiration or desire to do this. So you understand, um, you understand where you're coming from and where you stand. So just take like 30 seconds and do that. All right, and then what do you want to take away from this lesson? Write a sentence or two in regards to that. What are you hoping to learn? What are you hoping to walk away from as a result of this? Okay, anyone still writing? Okay, awesome. So let's get into the main part of this. What is long-term investing? So investing is the act of purchasing ownership in a company or a product or a fund with the expectation that the company will increase in perceived or actual value. This is a very, very simplified definition of investing but I feel like it's really helpful to start from a very simple point of view when you're just getting started and for what we're gonna be talking about today. Specifically, long-term investing is the most popular type because it really doesn't require frequent manipulation. Like you don't have to log in all the time. You don't have to constantly check things. You don't have to constantly buy or sell off your investments. And usually long-term investments return a good yield over time um, versus short-term trading or short-term investing, there's a lot more risk involved. Um, as far as types of investments, for long-term investments, there are five types. There are stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and then there are EFTs, 
and CDs. Have you, anyone here heard of like EFTs or CDs? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool, good. Okay, so a stock is a percentage of ownership of a company. You can own a percentage of a stock or a whole stock. Um, when you, by owning a percentage of a company, it usually doesn't mean that you get to this, you get to make the business decisions or, or manage the decisions <laughs> of a company, but with some stock that you can own, you are able to vote as a shareholder. Like I had some birth hire shock, whoa, um, Berkshire Hathaway stock. And um, with that stock, you do get to vote. And there's like an annual shareholders meeting and you can actually go physically to the meeting in person. So depending on the stock and what company you own it in, it has different, um, different benefits or features that come with that. And some are a non-voting stock where you don't have any decision-making or voting capability at all. A bond is a fixed income, meaning it doesn't change in value, instrument that represents a loan from you to the borrower. And typically these are from the government, but also corporations um, do bonds as well. So it's imagine yourself as like a bank <laughs> and with, uh, with this bond, you are loaning this business or the government money um, and you're going to, at a certain point, get that money back. Um, as far as a bond, what makes it different to other types of investments is that it has an end date, like a normal loan would. It has a principal, which is the loan amount. And the terms can either be a fixed interest rate or a variable interest rate. And it really just depends on the details of the specific bond. And when you're researching it and looking into it, all of that will be very clear and you'll be able to locate that information. But those are the details about a bond. And again, if you guys have questions, please just raise the hand and let me know any questions so far. Okay, awesome. Next. Ebony has a question. Yeah, I couldn't get to the button fast enough, I'm sorry. For bonds, so I would give money to a bank? No. And they would, no. You like a bank. You give a loan to a company. I yeah. give a loan to a company. Okay. Yeah, I use the bank as an example, um, but you're lending money to the government or a corporation, and that's a bond. And then you get back certain certain the interest then from that yes okay okay any other questions about bonds or stocks awesome okay let's go to mutual funds so a mutual fund is a like a basket of stocks they're composed all of all different types of stocks or bonds. And they cover a broad range. Um, and that's to increase the diversity within it. Um, it is like a pooled collection of assets. It can include stocks, bonds, and other securities. And it's not traded in the stock market on the exchange. It only trades once the market closes at the end of the day. And I believe the market closes at 5 p.m. Eastern time. The market runs on Eastern time. So I believe it's like um, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern standard time. So after the market closes, it trades. There are two different types of mutual funds I'm gonna talk about here. And the first one is an index fund. And the second one is an ESG which is Environmental, Social, and Governance Fund. An index fund is a type of mutual fund or EFT, so it can be in either category. And you'll understand why when I talk about EFTs later. But an index fund is a type of mutual fund with a portfolio that's constructed to match or track the components of the financial market index, like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. 
And the benefit of that is that it provides like a really broad market exposure. They have lower operating expense expenses and lower portfolio turnover. And portfolio turnover is like how often like new instruments or products are added to it and removed from it. And they follow their benchmark index regardless of the state of the market. So like if the market, um, if like the index goes up or down, it's going to follow that. And so these indexes have lots of different stocks and bonds and products in it. And so it's a really great way to really diversify your risk because you aren't just hedging on one stock or one bond. If one thing goes down, well, it doesn't mean everything went down. So you got some flexibility there. Yes, what's, what's up, Jason? In general, better than a savings account. Yes. <laughs> all these options may you might find better than a savings account, but it all depends on you know what your needs are financially. Okay, cool. So ESG. So ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Criteria. They are a set of standards for a company's operations that socially conscious investors use to screen potential investments. And so the environmental criteria considers how is a company performing as a steward of nature? The social criteria is examining how it manages relationships with its employees, its suppliers, its customers, and the communities where it operates. And then governance deals with a company's leadership, executive pay, um, audits, internal controls, and the rights of the shareholders. All right, any questions about um, mutual funds? We talked about index funds, we talked about ESGs. Those are the two most common types. Any questions about that before we move on to the next type of investment? Um, we go back to the first slide with mutual funds, with what it exactly is with the assets and this one or this one? Yeah, that the one before that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then you said that with the trading, uh, you said it's open in the daytime, then it ends at the end of the day where you can't. Yeah, so these aren't traded on the exchange. So the exchange is open from 9 a.m. to 5 a.m. Eastern time. And during that time, people are trading products, mostly stocks and bonds and things like that. Um, but it's not traded during the active market. It's only trades after the market closes. So while the market is closed, you can still place um, you can still place orders to buy or to sell once the market's closed. And that's what mutual funds do. Is there a reason why they are after market exchanging? Um, my understanding is that um, the reason that they do it once the market is closed is because at the end of the day, they know exactly where that product closed, right? So if they are like, they have a basket of stocks and bonds, well, and, and my just understanding is like during the day, the, flux, the market can fluctuate, right? The prices of things can fluctuate. But once the market closes, well, they know exactly where it ended for that day and where the market valued that particular product or that particular instrument. Okay. Now I'm not, a, I don't run a mutual fund. So I don't know the, like what they would say to that, but that's just what I think. Okay, that makes sense. All right, any other questions about mutual funds? Okay. Hmm. All right, the next type is an EFT. An EFT is an exchange traded fund. It is a type of pooled investment security that operates very much like a mutual fund. And typically EFTs will track a particular index, a sector, a commodity, 
or some other type of asset. EFTs, they can be purchased or sold on the stock exchange the same way a regular stock can. So that's the difference between a mutual fund and an EFT is that EFTs can be traded during the day, during the stock exchange, like any other stock. They can also be structured to track anything from the price of an individual commodity to a large and diverse collection of securities. And they can even be structured to track specific investment strategies. So um, whenever I've looked into EFTs, um, the EFT, the whatever um, resource or investing platform they're using to look up the information is gonna give you details about what is this EFT about? What is their goal? What is their strategy? And it, would tell, and it would tell you exactly what the strategy of this EFT is. That way you can make an informed decision about if that's one that resonates with you that you want to use to invest or not. Yes, Jason. Uh, with that explanation, it sounds like a less nimble hedge fund. Um, I'm not familiar with hedge funds, so I can't comment on that. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, cool. So offer, the great thing about EFTs is they offer lower expense ratios and fewer commissions than just buying individual stocks does. And it's a really popular choice for diversification just like mutual funds are. Now there are five different types of EFTs. There's bond EFTs, which is an EFT that's filled with just bonds. And they provide regular income to investors and they don't have a maturity or end date. If you recall earlier, when we talked about bonds, we talked about how it has an end date, it has a loan amount, and it has an interest rate, right? Well, only difference is, is that EFT bonds, bond EFTs don't have an end date. With stock EFTs, they track a single sector or an industry like travel or cars or uh, mining or, um, technology, and they provide a diversified exposure to a single industry. So like if we take, um, like let's take airlines, for example. Um, if airlines, if one airline, their stock starts going down, um, people start losing faith in that one airline, um, but you have other airlines in there that are still doing well, well, you haven't lost all of your investment because you've diversified your risk inside of this um, EFT for airlines. That's just an example. Now there are commodity EFTs. They invest in commodities like crude oil, gold, things like that. And they can provide a cushion during a slump in a stock market. Typically commodities don't really lose their um, value in the same way that like uh, a regular company would like a regular company stock would they tend to be a bit more stable which is why they can provide cushion during um a slump in the market yes jason you have a question uh no comment i i understand now after you explaining etfs so etfs are essentially hedge funds for people that don't have the money to be part of a hedge fund. A hedge fund is a group of investors and they have usually uh, an amount of capital that you have to have in order to be a part of the hedge fund. So for example, it'd be like a hundred million dollars is the absolute lowest limit that you have to have in order to be part of that. And then there's this collection of investors that are the hedge fund and they take all the capital from the different people who've given them capital and they invest that uh, strategically. Whereas an ETF is you don't have to have a particular amount of money in order to be a part of it. So in other words, ETFs are hedge funds for poor people. No, um, I wouldn't categorize it that way. Um, there are, depending on the EFT, some of them have minimums. 
a minimum amount of money that you have to invest in order to have that EFT. But not so it's not million. just. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just saying that ETFs are less exclusive hedge funds. Yeah. So yeah. the only exclusivity being that some EFTs do require you have you invest a minimum amount of money, and it varies. Okay. Um, the next two types of EFTs are currency EFTs and industry and sector EFTs. Currency EFTs track the performance of currency pairs consisting of domestic and foreign currencies. And industry and sector EFTs, those focus on a particular industry or sector. Um, they're used to rotate in and out of sectors during economic cycles. Um, that's going to be a little bit less relevant when you're doing long-term investing, but it's just something to keep in mind because you may come across those. All right, any other questions about EFTs before we move on to the next type of investment? Okay, cool. All right, the next type and actually the last type we're going to be talking about are CDs. CDs are certificates of deposits. If you've been on like any normal banking website, you've probably seen something about CDs on there. It's a product that banks and credit unions offer that provides an interest rate premium in exchange for you agreeing to leave a lump sum deposit untouched for a period of time. It's very similar to a bond in a way. Yes, your question, Jason? Yeah. Uh Basically, you get a little bit of you as the consumer that's investing in the CD, uh, you get a little bit of benefit and the benefit that the provider of the CD gets is that they know that they can invest your money into the stock market for a certain period of time. Because if you're not going to touch it, then it's free for them to use to invest. It's basically like a, a, a less, like it's like a... Um, more of an automatic way of investing. The bank or the provider of the CD does the investing because you have agreed that you're not gonna to touch that money. So now they know they can touch it. By law, they can touch up to 90% of it. Correct. Okay. Wait, so a CD is not a secured, um, I don't know if instrument's the right word, but. So they can't, the banks can't touch stuff that's in your CD, whatever amount of money or up to 90%, what Jason said. That's a good question. Yeah. So when you have your money with a bank, your bank, your money is insured up to a certain amount. Um, but the banks, your money isn't just sitting in a bank. Um, the banks do lots of things with the money that's there. They make loans. They, they're able to offer CDs. They offer lots of other products. They do invest the money. So, but that's happening anyway. It's not just in the case of a CD. Right. So then are there any, I guess, are there anything, I don't know the right terminology. So I'm gonna use the word instrument if you understand this. Are there any instruments that you would put into a bank that they can't touch that money? Or is that, that's just like the risk of a bank. You are trusting the bank to secure your money and that when you do want it, it is there for you, but they're allowed to play with it as, as they need. Um, as far as I know, the answer to that is no. And there's really not much of a risk in the bank doing anything and you're losing your money because your money's insured. Federally insured by the so federal like, government. That's what FDIC right. is. Yeah. Well, so like if the bank, if the bank were to like go into like, I don't know, some banks have financial issues, right? And they like make bad investments and they lose a lot of money or whatever, their, their customers don't lose their money because it's insured. And so they will get that money back no matter what happens to the bank. That's okay. why they're, that's why the money is insured. So, all right, I'll let you finish talking about the CD because I feel like you'll probably answer my question. Okay. So CDs are a safer and more conservative investment than stocks and bonds. And they also offer a lower opportunity for growth, but the benefit of them is that it's not volatile and you get a guaranteed rate of return. Um, when you purchase the CD, you know exactly what the percentage 
rate of return is and exactly what you're going to get back and the exact date you're going to get back. There's a lot of certainty with it. Um, and although you are locked into a term, like you won't touch this certain amount of money for a certain period of time, if you need to exit out of it early, um, they usually have terms built into it for that. Usually there may be some sort of penalty or something like that, but there's always a, there's usually always a way to get out of it if you need to. So it really just depends on the bank and the specific CD that they're offering. Okay, does that answer your question, Ebony, or do you still have one? Mm, I don't really have a, it didn't answer my question, but it made my question irrelevant. I was just seeing like the, what, basically what the point of the CD is. So yeah, I guess that it's a safer investment than stocks or bonds. So yeah, I just didn't know that the banks could touch it. I thought the C C CD was like the secure thing. I'm pretty sure it's not an actual CD either. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just stands for a certificate right. of deposit. Okay. Um, I'm wondering like why more people don't have CDs. Like why don't I have a CD? Like this sounds easy. Financial literacy. I mean, yeah, basically. Yeah, so, that's why we're doing this. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad had a lot of CDs when I was younger, he said. He doesn't oh. have them anymore? Or did they, mm. end, did they end and he was able to cash out? He, my mom spent all that money. So I think they cashed out, <laughs> ended up cool. buying land and um, yeah, my mom spent the money, so. I have one last comment. Um, this is really helping me get clear. And I mean, it's money, right? And if you want to make a lot of money, you're going to have to invest on your own in stocks that you think are going to work unless you have enough money to have a hedge fund manage it. That's what I'm getting from all this. You invest in individual stocks or have enough to have a hedge fund management manage it. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yep. And so, and so I think instead of paying a company to do it, learning to do it yourself. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Really just being informed is the key because it all depends on what you want to get out of it, what your strategy is, um, what your what amount of money that you have to work with, what your goals are. So um, everyone's approach is going to be different, which is why there's different options for everyone. Okay, we're gonna move on to investing platforms now. I'm gonna be talking about two investing platforms and these are two that I have experience with and I feel confident talking about. So the first one is Vanguard and the other one is TD Ameritrade. I sent all of you a referral to TD Ameritrade. So if you don't have any sort of investing account, you're interested in setting one up, then you can set up with them. Now, what's the commonality between these two is that they both offer no commissions, they both offer no data fees, and they both offer no platform fees, which is great. The exceptions to that, and what makes these different is that with Vanguard, if you aren't signed up for e-delivery, which is like get all your documentation electronically, there is a $20 annual fee. And there are a few specific Vanguard funds that do charge commission fees to cover high transaction costs and discourage short-term trading. But that will be very clear when you go to purchase these specific Vanguard funds. So it's not like something that you're surprised by if you're reading everything. And then with TD Ameritrade, they also have no trade minimums. And what that means is, Oftentimes there are various products that require you and you have to invest like minimum $3,000. I see that a lot um, for specific EFTs and mutual funds, like minimum $3,000 or minimum $10,000. It really just depends. But with TD Ameritrade, that minimum isn't there. Any question about investing platforms before we move on to the next section? I have a Vanguard account. I forgot about that long that I signed up for a long time ago. Awesome. I do like Vanguard. Vanguard's good. Okay. I do wanna add, I believe that I put this in here at some point. 
but just in case, did I put this in here? No, I did. Okay, I'm gonna get to it later. Okay, just to make sure I wasn't missing something. Research, 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 research. So um, for a diversified risk, if you wanna keep, you wanna do the basket mentality, I'd recommend EFTs and mutual funds. If one company loses its value, if one product loses its value, there are others in the same product to compensate for this, right? It's the don't get, don't put, um, well, that's the thing actually doesn't basket. apply to this, but you want to have different things in there, right? So if one goes down, you're not losing all of your money. That's the whole point. For stability um, and low, low risk, is gonna be bonds and CDs. They usually have a fixed rate and a fixed value that are unaffected by the market. And if you're doing a CD, it's federally insured. Now you might be wondering, well, what stocks or CDs or what products do I actually choose? Um, you're gonna to wanna to do research. There are tons of resources online to learn about these products so you can make an informed decision. A specific one I would recommend is Market Watch. That's an amazing website that has lots of details about all types of um, investment products um, so that you can start educating yourself about what these specific products are, what the strategy is behind them, how are they doing, what is their history, and the more that you read the stuff and look it up, the more comfortable you'll get with it. Yes, Jason. Uh, I also want to mention that on TD Ameritrade, uh, when you look into a stock or you invest in one, they'll provide a bunch of news about that stock and related stocks. Like right here, you'll see like Dow Jones, Market Watch. You can't see it. Crap. Well, it, anyways, on the TD Ameritrade website and app, they also provide... Um, news from market watch and, and other resources so you can get an idea of what's going on that's another way of getting your research yeah a lot of trading platforms um, when you look up the stock on it it does provide information about the stock uh, but i encourage you to use a wide variety of resources and websites because you might find one that that you resonate with a bit more better i really like market watch because it has almost anything I can want to know about a particular product, whereas sometimes on the trading platform, I don't find the exact information I'm looking for. So just be open-minded and look into everything that you can. What's up, Ebony? Um, I was just gonna mention that Robin Hood does the same thing, but you had mentioned that a lot of platforms do that, because I know um, not Acorns, another one does the same thing, but yeah, getting it. Uh, more detailed stuff is nice because they don't always pr provide like a whole host of like detailed information just because like that's not what the platform the platform's for. Mm -hmm. I agree and that is correct. What I what has been my approach and what has really helped me have the most consistency and longevity with investing is to invest in things that you care about or that you love or that you're passionate about. So like, I like to travel. And so I like to invest in a lot of products related to airlines, like Southwest stock or Delta stock or things like that. Um, it makes it a lot easier for me to understand the information when I'm doing the research and looking at the news and the information because I have some interest in it and some knowledge of it, even if it's just from a consumer level. And like, I wouldn't choose something like mining, like mining for gold. Sure, I like gold, but like <laughs> not mining. I don't know anything about mining and it doesn't really interest me. And, and if I'm trying to read the information about these, this mining EFT or look at the news, like a lot of it goes over my head because I really don't have, have the interest in it at that level. So this is a helpful tip and something I recommend do. I recommend that you do is start with things that interest you. Any questions about researching before we move on to the next section? Okay. Set goals. You're gonna to want to set some goals. And I have three questions here I want you to answer. And it's going to help you determine what your investing strategy is. So the first one is, what is your time frame for investing? 
So how long do you want to have your money invested for? Do you want to have it invested for five years, 10 years, 20 years? Are you thinking maybe one or three years? Are you thinking for after you die, maybe for your children or your descendants? Like you want to think about what is your time frame for investing based on where you are right now? The second question you're going to want to answer right now, <laughs> write this down, is are you investing for income or for growth? So when you're investing for income, you're investing with the expectation that you're going to get dividends out of it, like that you want to live off of this income from these investments. And investing for growth is when your products do produce returns and dividends, they're automatically reinvested and those continue to build, it builds on the, what was already there. So that's more of a growth strategy. So which one do you think that you will be interested in, income or growth? Typically a growth strategy is a more long-term strategy because all the money staying in there, you're not taking anything out and um, it's in there for the time frame that you set. Whereas as you're, if you're investing for income, as there are returns and dividends generated, you're automatically withdrawing those. That's more of a sort of a, I guess a short, it's a mix between short-term and long-term, but it's a little bit different. And then three, are there particular sectors or financial instruments that excite you? Goes back to the research question. Write down maybe two, one or two areas or industries that you're interested in. Like is it technology or travel or cars? or um, commodities or any something like that. So think about what sectors you're interested in. Maybe you're in, you were interested in the ESG, the environmental social governance, or you're interested in um, publications. So um, those are just some things to think about and I want you to jot down some answers um, so that you um, can start to build your strategy going forward. Any questions about investment strategy before we move on to types of accounts? <clears throat> okay, let's move on to account types. There's three different account types we're gonna talk about. The first is IRAs or 401ks. The second is Roth IRAs. And the third is brokerage. So an IRA is an individual retirement account. It's a savings account with tax advantages that individuals can open to save and invest for a long term. It's really common to use these to save for retirement. And the benefit of them is that when you put in your money now, it's not taxed. You're only taxed on the money when you go to withdraw it. Um, and if you withdraw the money before you're 59 and a half years old, there are penalties for that. So this really, really encourages, this essentially like, if you wanna do this, this is like, this is your retirement fund. This is your 401k. You're not gonna touch this money until you're 59 and a half or older. Now Roth IRAs, it's also an individual retirement account, and it's called Roth because it's named after the, the man that, it, that created it. And it allows qualified withdrawals on a tax-free basis. What that means is that when you put your money in, you're taxed now. So you're taxing the money you put in, and then your money is able to grow untaxed, is able to grow tax-free. And when you withdraw the money, you also don't have to pay taxes on that. So the benefit of this is that you pay the taxes now, so you don't have to pay the taxes later. And this is best if you think that later when you're going to withdraw the money, you, if you think taxes are going to be higher. I mean, you don't really, how can you really know? But, and that's sort of a logic to it. Um, now, there is a um, cap to how much you can contribute to a Roth IRA. Your limit is $6,000 or um, it can't be more than the income that you earned. 
Um, and it's only 6,000 if you're under 50 years old. If you're over 50 years old, there are different stipulations to that. Yes, Jason. Uh, it would make more sense to get taxed now if you're investing in a Roth, Roth IRA to make money. Because if you're getting taxed for 5,000 and then you pull out 50,000, it makes sense to get taxed when it was only 5,000. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on your goals. Um, I agree. I have a question. Yes. So, so you said you can only put 6,000 in if you're under 50, like you can't, you can't go over that. That's correct. And then, but your money can grow more than 6,000. Like you can put- Of course, money, yes. And it just can grow depending on all the things. Okay. Yep. So let's say like you have this, you have a Roth IRA, you've had it for five years and every year you've put in the max contribution that you could that year of 6,000. And it wasn't more than what you earned that year. Then each year that the, that 6,000 is growing tax-free. Wait, so it's 6,000 per year? Yes. Nine. Oh, I was like, that doesn't seem like that much money. Okay. Okay, awesome. Now the last account type is a brokerage. A brokerage account is an arrangement in which an investor deposits money with a licensed brokerage firm, which places trades on behalf of you. The income that is generated from it is taxable as capital gains. And the account types vary depending on how much assistance you need. So there are some companies that offer full brokerage service with financial advisors that charge fees that'll manage everything for you, that'll do all of the investing for you, but they charge a fee to do that. And there are others that are do it yourself that charge no fees. Now, I know from experience that Vanguard offers both. With Vanguard, you can hire a financial advisor to manage your investments for you, or you can do it yourself. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're deciding like how much help you actually need. If you start your account, if you're like, I really need some guidance, I don't know what I'm doing, look at the services that the platform that you own offers, because they most are likely offer some sort of um, financial advising service, whether if it's just a phone call or giving some advice, or if they're taking over your portfolio and doing all of the investing for you. Yes, Jason. Uh, I'd rather fall off the bike and skin my knee and soon learn how to wheelie then uh, have my dad ride the bike for me the whole way. Yeah, I like that you can ask though, if you uh, have questions or need some help, I like that you have could have that option though. So yeah, like I said, everyone's, everyone's at a different place. So that's why the services are there for if you want them. So is it still a brokerage account if you're doing it yourself? Yes. Okay. I'm not understanding that. What do don't you have, understand? So you have a, a brokerage account and then the person who manages that, that's not the broker or am I the broker? No, you, 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 uh, you invest in a stock and somebody puts the money into the, the exchange for you. It's just a person, a brokerage account is just a person that actually has the authority to do it for so you. That's who the broker is. Yeah, so, a word, so the word broker isn't on here. Right. It's just a brokerage account. So like with TD Ameritrade, for example, like you place an order that you want to buy a certain amount of shares of a certain stock. And then the brokerage firm, TD Ameritrade, they place that order in the exchange for you. Sometimes it's an actual person. Sometimes they're using automated robots to do it. It really just depends. Okay, um, I didn't realize that TD Ameritrade was a brokerage. They account. offer a brokerage account. I believe they may offer other accounts as well. They might offer IRAs. They might offer other types of accounts, but they for sure offer a brokerage account. Okay, so then with a brokerage account, are you only trading stocks and bonds or can you do EFTs as well? You can do EFTs as well. You can do stocks, bonds, EFTs, um, mutual funds. 
Okay. Um, right. but another difference here between a brokerage account and other accounts that I didn't stipulate is that with a brokerage account, it allows you to do a lot more complex trading um, and lends itself to short-term trading. Like if you want to do options or if you want to bet against the market or different things like that, then you need a brokerage account to do that. I'm not getting into all that right now, but that's you can't do that sort of stuff with an IRA or with a Roth IRA. That's what yes, I Jason. came for. I came for that. I want the puts and the and the all of that. I, yeah, I, I came for this part right here. I want to understand more of the brokerage part, part of it, you know. But it's all right. This this was good because now I'm I'm sure I don't want all that other stuff. So I appreciate it. Part two coming soon. What'd you say? Part two coming soon. Okay. Yeah, because this this helped me understand um, more of the terminology to also get clear. That's what I wanted out of this, just clarity on the different things, just concise instead of learning them at random points in time. And yeah, I think that, well, I still want uh, more information on a couple of things like CDs um, and EFTs. Because I feel like with EFTs now, that's like this whole thing. But specifically with trading and stuff, I want to go deeper into that too. But this is good because now I understand the basis for trading in general. Because I know like this all applies. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I definitely plan on doing some more in the future. And yeah, so we can continue to learn and continue to educate ourselves. And um, yeah. But you said you had questions, more questions about CDs? Um, more so like how to actually go about getting one, like the specifics of my bank and like how to set that up and everything. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, have you ever like opened a bank account online? Not online, no. I've only okay. done it. So um, you can, of course, go into the bank and do it. Um, but you can do it online. So you can set up bank accounts online. You can open a new account online. You can purchase a CD online. Um, okay. It's really simple. It's really easy. So I recommend like whatever bank you're with, if you go into like, um, like account offerings or something like that, there may have an option there, or you could just go to their main website and look at the financial products that they offer. Honestly, a lot of people don't ever do that. And they just log into their bank account and then that's it. Or then they go to the bank and set up their account and then they log in and that's it. And they don't really look around. Um, but on the bank's website, it'll have um, information about their offerings. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've looked at the website an example in terms of like the routing number. And I think that was about it. <laughs> so, what is your, what bank are you with? Um, I'm with... Uh, I'm with a credit union back in my hometown. I'm, then I'm with the other credit union back in Carbondale. So I'm not okay. with anything. So I know that credit unions can sometimes be limited. Like my main bank, they don't have any trust, uh, a trust department. I don't think my other one does either. So I am in the process of looking for a bank that does have a trust department. Okay. So let's do this. I'm going to pull up an example. Jason, I want to know, was it a pretty lengthy process to buy your first stock? No, no. Um, op opening the brokerage account took like 20 minutes. I mean, you need your routing and account number, which I mean, I, I'm really familiar with, with banks, like online banks. I, I have four bank accounts um, with different banks and, but it was only like a 20 minute process. And that was the most challenging thing, which isn't hard. Um, and then after that, um, to like, to buy like my first stock, um, there was a bunch of options for like, you know, like you can short stocks and there's like you could set it to where it sells at a certain point automatically and everything. And, and that stuff I didn't quite understand. So I just did straightforward, which is like you select market and then you buy the stock. 
so all in all, all the time invested, 30 minutes to open a brokerage account and buy my first stock. Okay. And you have to have a brokerage account then to buy a stock. Is that right? right? Okay. Um, you don't have to have a brokerage account. You just need to have any account. Any of those oh. account types you can buy stocks with whether it's an IRA, a Roth IRA, a 401k. So did you say that Robinhood is not, so is Robinhood the same as TD, TD, Ameritrade, whatever that's called? They're both investing platforms. Okay, they're investing platforms. And then through them, you can then have a brokerage account and all of that? Yes. Okay. Okay. I feel like that makes it, well, that's how you have to do it. So I don't know. I've not been on um, other ones besides Robin Hood and it's not Acorns. I can't think of what it is, but so I, I don't know how they are, how they're similar, but buying stocks, essentially buying anything, any product would be the same on each platform, right? Because there are certain rules that these companies have to abide by in order to participate in the market. So like buying a stock on TD Ameritrade versus Robinhood is going to be the same. What's going to be the same? Buying a stock or does it depend on the type of account you have? It depends on, it depends on the platform. For instance, TD Ameritrade, if you want to buy a part of Amazon stock, right? So um Amazon stock. Amazon stock right now is three thousand, roughly three thousand dollars for a stock. If you don't have three thousand dollars, you can still buy a part of that stock on TD Ameritrade. But on Vanguard, you can't buy a part of a stock. There are certain platforms where you can't buy a percentage of a stock. You can only buy the whole stock. Right. So it, it just really depends on like what platform you're on and what you are trying to do. Um, and you will learn that as you explore the platforms and look into how you can invest with them. Okay. So they're not all the same. Yes, you can one them, you can buy and sell investments, but the specific, how the specific process may vary. Okay, yeah. Um, going back to CDs, um, I think I really like this site, Bankrate. Um, they've made some suggestions for like great CDs. And so this is just an example. If we look at Capital One, they offer a CD. There is no minimum deposit. It has an automatic return of 0.7% and the term is one year. Wow. So you can you buy the CD. Like... This has no minimum deposit, but is there still a fee to buy the CD? Or is the CD like when you buy a drink that the, the container is included? Does that make sense? Well, you're not really buying anything. You're It's a, like a loan. You're putting, you're investing your money into it, but there's no minimum amount. Whereas- and It's going to give you money back just because you decided to sign up with a CD with them? No. So remember a CD is you are agreeing to not touch a certain amount of money, essentially lend them money for a period of time in exchange for you doing that, they're going to agree to give you a certain percentage back. Right, so how are they getting away with not having the down a minimum deposit? I don't know. <laughs> like, I, that's I, mean, that's, like. I mean, that's their prerogative, what product, like what terms they decide to offer. That's weird. Either okay. way, they're still getting money that they can use for whatever purposes they need to use it for. Their only obligation to you is that they have to stick to these terms. And when the one year is up, they give you back your principal plus the 0.7%. Right. So then can you add money? Like, so you put the money in to start with, and then your term starts. Can you keep adding money before the term is over? Is it like a one-time uh, in my experience, no. Okay. There may be there may be exceptions to that, but in my experience and what I've looked into, the answer to that is no. Here's okay. another example. Here's Pentagon Federal Credit Union. They offer a CD with a return of 1.25%. 
you have to put in a minimum of $1,000 and the term is two years. Okay, that, that makes sense. I'm wondering how Capital One does that, but that seems more, I don't know if I would say advanced, but. Well, the thing about it, but either way they're getting money to work with. I don't, it's, they're not at any disadvantage. But isn't the money deposit, like the money that they're able to play with? Yeah, but if thousands or millions of people are doing that. <laughs> but if everybody's Ebony, doing what? Um, even your bank, even your money in your savings account, they can play with that too. Yeah, they're right. doing that anyway. So this is just extra money that they get to use for whatever financial services they want to offer, whatever investments they want to make. It's so it doesn't like matter if you only got $1 in, but if that's the power of a bank, if everyone puts in a dollar, if 2 million people put in a dollar, they have $2 million. Right, but I just don't understand why there's a minimum deposit. Like how do they make money off of that if there's $0 that you're putting in? Like I know that they can- You can't put in $0. In. Well, that's what it says. It says minimum deposit, $0. I understand that it says that. Oh, but, but then put in zero dollars. You're not. You're, that's investing nothing, and then getting back nothing. Because then you don't get anything back because you didn't put anything in. Yeah, you can't. It's it says zero because they have to put something there. It should say one dollar. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's false advertising. Yes, but also if we just think about it, no one would invest no money. Then well, right, that's no a investment. Point. Yeah, I was like, why is that even there if they're saying there's not even a deposit? That's literally nothing. Ebony, what's the weather like on Venus these days? It's 85 degrees. Wonderful. Okay, we're going to go back <laughs> to the presentation, um, and we're going to now talk about taxes. <laughs> Pisces. So you have to pay taxes on any withdrawals from your account with the exception of a Roth, because with a Roth, you pay taxes before you put the money in. Whatever investing platform you're using is going to notify you and send you tax forms when it's time to file your taxes. I've gotten emails and mail from Vanguard and TD Ameritrade that it's tax time and to look at my forms. So you're going to, you need to do that. And I recommend that you hire a professional CPA if your situation becomes complex and you become confused. It's better to hire someone to help you. Um, it's not that expensive to hire a tax professional if you get confused versus making a mistake or not paying the right taxes and then um, the IRS is mad at you. Um, so do that, please. All right, please that sit. is the lesson. Um, I hope you guys have fun learning about long-term investing. Um, and before I move on to the last part here, do you guys have any questions about anything that we talked about in here about long-term investing. So you said you only have to pay taxes if you withdraw. Right? I said that if you have a Roth, you don't have to pay taxes um, on it because you pay taxes mm -hmm. before the money went in. Right. But anything else? Yes. Everything else you pay taxes on. There's not a minimum with stocks or anything. Like, uh, so like if you're on a W-2, depending on the state, there's like a minimum that you can make. And if you don't make that minimum, you don't have to pay taxes if you don't want to. With stocks and I don't know about bonds, but at least with stocks, from what I know, you still have to pay taxes because you're never taxed at all in the first place. Yes. Oh. So if you have a CD, you have to pay taxes on that or a mutual fund, you have to pay taxes on that. Yep. You have to pay taxes on the CD, even if your term is not up. Do you pay I believe money? that you do. If you do end up having to pay taxes on it, again, usually whatever service you invested with, if, they, if there's some tax required, they notify you and they provide you with forms, right? It's like for your employer, right? They send you or they give you your uh, W-2 or your form that you need to complete your taxes. These investing platforms have to do the same thing. Right. Okay. I always wondered, I thought that actually it was the same as like when you're under a W-2, like you have to make a certain amount. So I didn't pay taxes last year on what I made last year, which was like 91 cents or something like that. It was something really low. So 
I'm not concerned about it, but that's good to know because obviously I don't want to keep doing that moving forward. Yeah, I think it's if you make, is it if you make under 5,000 a year? I think it depends on the state. Oh, okay. Because regardless there's... of what, like the, the, that's for income tax. Yeah. That's... Um, but when it comes to investing, you always have to pay taxes. Always pay taxes. You always have to pay. And if you by chance pay too much, then they'll give you some back. Um, but it's much better than not paying at all. <laughs> and then the IRS <laughs> is coming after you for money. This is true. Okay, really any other questions are. about long-term investing? I have a question about stocks in general. Yeah. Um, so let's say the stock that you bought did good for the day or I don't even know, went up 10%. I don't even know how to read them, read the charts right now. But um, does everyone get the same amount of return when that stock maybe did 10% better, 20% better? I don't even know. I don't yeah. know how to say it. Okay. So everyone would get $200 then, let's say. So it's not that you get $200. It's that, let me, let me pull up a screen here. Let me pull up a chart and it's a lot easier for me to talk about it um, if I can show you a visual. Okay. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so right here I have Amazon stock. This is for the past five days. And so let's say on the 24th of February, Amazon stock, and if you see in blue text, it was $2,800 basically. And so, but the next day on February 25th, it went up to $3,000 roughly. So that means that the stock that you bought is now worth $3,000. If you bought it when it was, worth um, 2,800 um, and then it went up to 3,000, well, then you, you gained, your stock gained value. Uh -huh. But if you bought it when it was 3,000 and then it dropped down to 2,800, well, then your stock lost value. So when the stock goes up, you don't just get money. It's just the value of what you bought changes. Oh. So this, the value is changing over time. And depending on when you buy and when you sell determines how much your return is. So if you bought when it was oh. low and then over the course of, let me change this to a year, right? So if you bought the stock, when it was up here, when it was $3,700, but then now it's $3,000, well then over the long-term so far, you've sort of lost some value. But the great thing about long-term investing is that generally over time, the stock value goes up. So this is the all-time view of Amazon stock from when it was initially went IPO to today. And so over the long term, you can see that it goes up. And that's usually trajectory with most stocks is that the market generally always goes up if you stay in it long enough. And so that's the benefit of long term investing is because you're not worrying about daily or weekly or even yearly fluctuations. You're looking more long term. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it sure does. So like if you wanted to um, do stocks for to have income instead of growth, would it make more sense to, would that be short-term trading? Is that what short-term trading? Um, are you, so you're asking about investing for income, is that correct? Yeah. So that would be dividends, right? Getting payouts as time goes on short and short term. Correct. So if you're investing for income, that would mean that when, let's say, the stock goes up in value, you have it 
set to where when the value increases, that those dividends, the profits, the returns are not reinvested, but are withdrawn. So I don't know if, if TD Ameritrade has this feature, but in Vanguard, I can set it to on each specific investment I have, what happens when there's a return generated. I can put in whether I wanted to reinvest it, whether I wanted to withdraw it or a variety of other options. Yeah, you can do that on there too. Huh. So what's the purpose of reinvesting it? then when you reinvest that money then that money can grow like let's say you put in five thousand dollars to invest and every time that five thousand the value went over five thousand your initial investment you have it set to income to take out the money so it's always just that five thousand that's growing but that's that's all that you're making money off of versus if the five thousand grows to you know, 5,100, well, now you're investing 5,100, right? So your returns are able to increase the more money you have that's actively in there. Ebony, you're uh, mm -hmm. muted if you're trying to talk. No, I'm trying to get stuff figured out. Uh, we got to get the box the box soon, the box truck soon. And um, then we're just trying to get stuff figured out for the evening because now it has a show. So I'm sorry, but it's okay. I'm just listening right now. So, so then I have a question on top of that. So um, if you are pulling out your money, um, are you making the same amount? Uh, so if you have five thousand dollars and it goes up a thousand dollars and you pull that money out rather than just keep it in to six thousand you're still making the same amount of money whether you keep it in or pull it right well no or, so if you bought five thousand worth of amazon stock and then the value of the stock went up so that the value of your investment is now five thousand one hundred dollars and you withdraw that well, now you have a hundred extra dollars than you did when you invested initially. But if you take it out, you're not, it's not invested anymore, right? So taking it out means you're selling it. So you're buying and selling. So you bought 5,000 worth of Amazon stock. The value went up, say, to 6,000. And you decide, okay, I want this money now. Then you sell that stock and then you get your $6,000 for example. Oh, okay. So I, I want to make a comment. The weird thing about the market is essentially, especially with long-term trading, I always thought this was weird and why I've been hesitant about investing as well as just not understanding it full, fully enough to know like how to make the moves. But you can invest and watch your stock go up, but you don't have access to any of that money until you sell it, which is kind of the same as having a car. Is your car is worth ten thousand dollars? Well, it's not because your car depreciates in value, so never mind. Um, but yeah, you could say you have, you know, you invested five thousand and you've made an extra three on it, making it an eight thousand when you pull it out. But unless you pull it out, you can't use that money. You're just investing. And so that's leave, kind of like the weird thing about it. And if like, you leave money right. in, never mind. No, go ahead. Uh huh. I mean, it's just I don't know. It seems pretty straightforward to me. It's like a, it's like a, um, it's just like a like a bank account used to be. Like, like you put money in, and it either goes down in value or up. And if you pull the money out after it's gone up, and then you want to re, you want to buy that stock again. Now you have to buy it at the price that it's now at. So it pays off if you think that the stock's gonna go up higher and you don't need that money right now. Yeah. So, so, if, if, so if you, but also some market. So if you pull out any money, you have to pull out the whole stock? No. no. You can sell, let's say um, you bought two of Amazon stock. Right now Amazon stock's like $3,000. So you bought two shares at $6,000. You can sell one of the shares. You don't have to sell both. 
Okay. So any money that you make, though, if you pull it out, then you pull out of the share of the stock. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, right. All you're doing is buying and selling shares. That's it. Yeah. And the share increases in value or decreases in value. And if you sell off the share, whatever the price of the share is at, that's how much money you get. When you gotcha. I clarify this, I think this will help make sense of it. So for example, with Vanguard, and I'm using them as an example because I've experienced this. So when um, my investment generates a return, right? It went up in value um, or what have you, um, then that extra money Vanguard uses to buy fractional shares of a stock or an EFT or a mutual fund. So whatever extra money that there is that's generated, that's used to reinvest and buy more of that same product. But okay. To keep it simple though, Leta, when it comes to like just buying an individual, like a share of an individual stock, you buy the share at the cost of what that share is at the time. And then when you sell it, you sell it at whether it went up in value or down in value. So it's really straightforward when it right. comes to stocks. Like, right. if I buy a dollar, if I buy a, um, a share of a stock and it's $1 for the share and it goes up to $2 and I sell that share, I now have $2. I no longer have the share because I sold it. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking if you made money off of it that you could pull out that extra money but still keep that stock in. But if you want any of the money, then you just, you have to, you just some share has stock. to be sold, right? Yeah, some, some... that's not true. The whole share doesn't have to be sold. Yeah, I'm not saying that. Okay, it sounded like that's what you just said, though. <laughs> no, I'm saying some of the share has to be sold if you want money. Okay, yeah, that's correct. And then that's when you could choose to put it in a, a, a CD or have your money moved around. You just can't pull it out. It's if, not if pulling you, out, it's buying or selling. Yeah, you so either buying, place pull out with buying or selling because it's not like a bank account. Exactly. Okay. You, you're always buying or selling part or all of a share. It's, it's always buying or selling. It's, yeah. Okay. All right, folks. Hmm. Do you feel like you learned something today? about long-term investing? Did you learn something new? Did you get a refresher? Do you feel like you have enough information that you wanna start learning more or doing more or investing? Then consider Venmoing me at, at Asha Oya and giving me money in gratitude for this <laughs> workshop that I put together for you guys. And this is the end. This is the end. I really wanna thank you guys. I really had fun doing this. And I think it's great that we are talking more about investing. And I think it's great that we can have like a workshop or a call where we're just talking about that. And we can share what we know and help each other. So yeah, you did it. I have, I have one thing I just wanna say, well, two things. First of all, uh, Asha, I already told you how much I was gonna compensate you if you put this together. Let up, this will totally make sense in like the next 24 hours, I promise. If it doesn't already make yeah. sense, it will. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. I'm so appreciative for it. So appreciative. Thank you, Asha. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Ebony. Thank you, Letta. Thank you. Thank you, Letta and everybody. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for I being such a great study. participant.